the reasons why there is no coherent policy uh, uh, illicit towards the North Caucasus, which is probably the fundamental foreign policy issue and security issue for Georgia. And nevertheless, we never achieved any coherence. There are probably objective and not so objective problems with that. In the first place, the North Caucasus is extremely diverse and complex. The second is that there exists certain ambiguity of Georgian perceptions of Russia. We, still, we are still struggling um, among our political elites to define what Russia means for Georgia. Um, that was the case with Shevardnadze, it remains the issue now. Uh, it's uniformly understood that so, Saakashvili decided for once and all that Russia is bad and uh, it's a danger and threat, but if you look at the, at the pattern of collaboration and uh, discord between Russia and Georgia, then you see the, a very interesting uh, aspect of uh, collaboration in the first few months of Georgia-Russian relationship, which was rather curious. Um, the same about Shevardnadze, there were moments when Shevardnadze effectively gave up um, his independent policy um, and gave into Russians. But later on, he sort of recovered from that and uh, started, uh, uh, restarted an independent line, an independent line in foreign policy. The third reason why there is no coherence in our policy towards the North Caucasus is not, the issue is not taken seriously. It is taken seriously on an emotional level. But if you look at the resources, intellectual and otherwise, committed to the issue of the North Caucasus, um, including, say, the curriculum of our universities, the International Relations Department, how much attention is devoted to studying Russia, studying the North Caucasus, which again may be considered as a key issue, then you see a huge disproportion uh, between, say, say, studying the European Union, per se, which takes up uh, about 60% uh, of our curriculum in IR department, even though we are not members and will never be. And then if you take the focus on the North Caucasus, then you just see that it's somewhere in, in, the, in the corner and significant. Then if you reverse the, the thing and look from the policy perspective, what is happening with our security and with our national security and uh, foreign policy, then you see that actually uh, the European Union is a bit not so significant for Georgia in current policy terms. And whatever is happening is, is, is related with the uh, North Caucasus and its spillover effects to the South. Right? So the, 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 the consecutive problem is uh, the lack of commitment and resources. Um, the issue of also availability of these resources. Um, if you compare even that uh, to the to the period in the in the Soviet uh, context, a lot of Georgian scholars, at least, would study the North Caucasus, and this is this has been until now what actually kept those very thin lines connecting Georgia and the North Caucasus, the cultural heritage of the Georgian scholars that studied the, the linguistics and history of the North Caucasus. Um, then I think the, a policy problem is also a very instrumental view of the North Caucasus um, and that is related with the earlier point of that the, 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 the North Caucasus is always seen in the global context. Because if you take the North Caucasus as a systemic issue that cannot be changed, then, of course, you take an instrumental approach to it, and then you try to use little bits of policy for undermining it here, but collaborating there, but there is no one overarching approach, so to speak, and the policy line. And finally, uh, if you take the cultural, so to speak, or ideational aspect of it, uh, the predominant narrative in Georgia is that uh, we belong to the West. We are a Western country, we are a European country, and so on and so on. And that, that by implication means that you know, the, the region doesn't really matter that much. Uh, because it, it will never be the West. 
So, let, let's take a policy approach. How important is the North Caucasus for Georgia? The trouble with Georgian policy to the North Caucasus is that in short-term perspective, the North Caucasus for, for the regime's policy, including Shevardnadze, including Saddam it has always been not so significant. Because it can be manipulated in short-term perspective without, uh, uh, for your own political uh, ends, without accruing major, uh, so to speak, costs and liabilities. However, if you look in, in a long-term perspective, a longer-term perspective, the deteriorating situation in the North Caucasus over the last 20 years has been the major source of Georgia's insecurity. And there is no reason to assume or imply that this is going to end in some way. It is going to continue and it is going to deteriorate. Therefore, um, it, 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 my, my argument is that there, there is an urgent need for a coherent policy towards the North Caucasus. So to go back to the initial point, theoretically, Georgia-Russian collaboration over the North Caucasus problems would be desirable for both parties. And there are historical examples from the end of the 18th century um, to uh, occasional cases in the last 20 years when uh, regimes in Russia and Georgia helped each other intermittently to deal with the North Caucasus issues, such as, for example, handing over of Chechen rebels to Russia. That happened in 2004, I guess, in early 2004. And there were other cases, such as the, the events of Lopota a few weeks ago, when uh, effectively we managed to exterminate a group of anti-Russian rebels, as it goes. So, um, how do we explain this? The absence of such collaboration, of um, sort of permanent collaboration. Um, I think systemic factors would not suffice to explain the puzzle because global and regional balances of power make little sense in this case. Uh, they are, I think, quite independent of uh, structurally of the problem of the North Caucasus. Um, and second, geopolitics defined as uh, energy security is also is important but not this decisive in terms of it, uh, in terms of why Georgia and Russia will collaborate over the North Caucasus. Um, it is interesting that domestically no two regimes, there were regime changes in Russia, there were regime changes in Georgia, uh, no two regimes managed to collaborate for a for longer for in, in, in the longer term in the last twenty years. Um, so you cannot explain it simply by putting an emphasis of discourse between the regimes that, you know, Yeltsin and Shevardnadze, Shevardnadze and Putin, Putin and Saakashvili, Gamsakurdi and Yeltsin, Gamsakurdi and Gorbachev. I mean, there were numerous variations of these, so to speak, uh, of these regimes. And uh, ideally, there could be a case when two regimes of uh, made their interests uh, to coincide, um, but uh, made their interests coincide, but uh, unfortunately that never happened. And that is a curious case. So we just cannot explain it by simply regime type, right? The absence of collaboration. <coughs> Here, identity and cultural differences between Georgians and Russians that are very often alluded to cannot explain that absence of collaboration either, because that, that factor, uh, that variable is a bit too broad and unfalsifiable in social scientific terms to explain the pattern. So, my hypothesis here would be that the enmity between Georgia and Russia was constructed and then constantly reproduced in the last 20 years. Um, and I think, well, in theoretical terms, the uh, historical institutionalist approach would, uh, could be used here that there was a crucial moment in the late 1980s and early 90s when these two narratives were formed, respectively in Georgia and in Russia. That for Russians, for Georgians, it was all about 
colonial struggle, that, uh, the, that the demise of the Soviet Union was needed in order to make Georgia independent. And for Russians, it was a, a, few, it was a story of betrayal by Georgians, that the, the Russians gave so much to Georgians, and nevertheless, these unthankful, ungrateful Georgians decided to undermine the Soviet Union and Russia. And that is where, where that started. And then, of course, the personalities of the three Georgian leaders were completely unpalatable to Russians in the last 20 years. Kamsaburdia was a dissident, Shevardnadze was a perestroika activist who helped destroy the Soviet Union, and then Saakashvili was an American trained lawyer who was clearly, from their perspective, and he is an American uh, agent of influence. And then, under Putin and Saakashvili, especially the rhetoric of revival of the Soviet Union, went against the revival of the promotion of democracy. That was, in, in, in some ways, in Georgian uh, parlance, so to speak, uh, other way of spreading of American interest and Western interest in, the, in Georgia and the Caucasus. So we see that this theme of uh, pro-Soviet, anti-Soviet is still present and sort of fits in this, these two narratives, respectively Georgian and Russian narratives. So my argument here would be that these narratives were reproduced among the elites continuously. And without understanding these narratives and the power of these narratives, it is impossible to understand why Russian-Georgian collaboration over the most important issue of security for both countries, the North Caucasus, hasn't happened. So I understand my time is up. So. Uh, I think we, Georgia faces now a foreign policy impasse that the West did not materialize in power terms for Georgia's security. We have some sympathy from the West, but it's not enough for anything. Alienation of Russia did not win Georgia even sympathy of the North Caucasus. Uh, the fact that Russia is our enemy doesn't really help us to win. Uh, the North Caucasians, power asymmetry with Russia is real and present threat, and we cannot go away from that. And the difficult question here is whether some kind of security collaboration with Russia or with the North Caucasus may reduce the Russian menace. Um, and uh, that's a very difficult question. I don't have an answer to that. Clearly, uh, the answer from the systemic point of view would be, of course not, because it's not just about narratives, it's not just about domestic politics, it's not just about uh, security problems, it's, it's a global uh, problem, global context and uh, global showdown that determines the North Caucasus. But my minor argument here would be that only some kind of change of these narratives within Georgia and Russia can ultimately lead to more rational Georgia-Russian relationship as opposed to dysfunctional relationship that we have now. Thank you. ...a general analysis of the strategic situation in the Caucasus and uh, Georgia's place in that. Uh, considerable amount of difficulty finding a way of framing it. Then, by chance, uh, the national security concept appeared, and it provides a framework for making some more general observations about uh, the region and also uh, Georgia. So I guess I should also say thank you to Georgia's National Security Council for producing the document in a very convenient and timely way. Um, the uh, national security concepts have several functions. One is analytical and strategic. They summarize the country's values, describe its strategic environment, identify its interests, identify the threats to those interests, and they establish uh, policy priorities based on threat assessment. These analyses and this definition of policy priorities presumably inform the development of national strategy and security policy. In other words, they're, they, they form the base for an elaboration of policy and practice. 
Flawed analysis is therefore likely to produce flawed policy. And uh, bad policy in difficult circumstances can produce painful consequences. Other functions of such concepts are communicative. Concept papers such as this one communicate to the public what the government is thinking about national security. They perform the same function with regard to communicating government thinking to other states. How a state publicly conceptualizes its national security can reassure or it can alarm other interested states. Finally, uh, concepts uh, such as these can reflect and legitimize policies that governments have adopted for other reasons. In this respect, concepts may be more about political messaging than about recent strategic analysis. My basic argument is that although the concept has a number of strengths, it also has a number of strategic uh, shortcomings. Um, <clears throat> These uh, reflect, I think, uh, the shortcomings as strategic analysis. These reflect the government's domestic political interests and also their effort to maintain and to increase political, economic, and security support from Western states. In short, as an analysis of the security <coughs> problematique of Georgia, uh, it has a number of problems, but I think it's a pretty good piece of political messaging. This paper is divided into three sections. It begins with a discussion of Georgia's internal security uh, and its regional and uh, uh, internal security and regional and international security situation. Here, the point is that Georgia has a history of state weakness and internal instability and unresolved conflict. Which, um, the external dimension is one of considerable conflict or potential conflict involving peoples and states on Georgia's northern and southern and eastern borders. And as you expand the circle out, the South Caucasian region is bounded by uh, three larger powers with a history of conflict, not least conflict over the Caucasus. Um, a, and, and to some extent, the recent practice of intervention in the southern Caucasus, that refers notably to Russia. And Georgia has no binding alliance relationships with other states farther away that might balance regional risks in a crisis. This goes back to Georgia's point about asymmetry in the structure of power. In other words, the background for Georgian national security is very challenging. Major risks to national security are considerable. There's little margin for error. The potential costs of getting it wrong are very high, and there's consequently a real need for careful and realistic national security planning. Turning to the strengths of the concept, I'll briefly mention three. One is the embrace of the multi-dimensional notion of security, which I think is very sensible. It goes beyond military and defense issues and recognizes the links between democracy, social cohesion, majority minority relations and economic development, the links of all of these things to the security of the Georgian state and its people. A second is the clearly stated commitment to the pursuit of security through multilateral institutions and through international law or recourse to international law. Finally, the concept contains a clear preference for solving security problems by peaceful means and for the peaceful resolution of existing disputes. This is a refreshing contra a contrast to some other states in the Caucasian region, for example, Azerbaijan, which quite self-consciously reserves the right to use force to settle its problem with Karabakh. So far, so good. However, as is often the case, the devil is in the detail. To me, uh, one shortcoming of the concept is the lack of analysis of threats of internal instability in Georgia. This is surprising given that over the past 22 years, the country has experienced two and a half civil wars, 
elaborate on, on, on that if you want me to. Um, uh, and uh, two, insurrections. One, violent, and one, peaceful. The country has never had a constitutional transfer of power. The potential uh, for internal security difficulties is, I think, clearly evident right now in the lead-up to parliamentary elections. There's also an economic dimension to, the, uh, to uh, potential instability. Uh, this uh, actually is related to some extent to Nani and Ella's comments uh, of yesterday. Uh, the recent record of economic growth in Georgia has been impressive, but the impact of growth on security depends uh, not only on absolute amounts, but on how growth is distributed and who benefits from it. Georgia is becoming a more unequal society, both in general and along the rural-urban dimension of Georgian society. In public opinion polls, the major concern of the population appears to be uh, unemployment and poverty, and until recently, uh, inflation. Uh, by the way, the government of Georgia has done a pretty impressive job of reducing the rate of inflation uh, over the past year, to the extent that we now have negative inflation. Um, now, whether that is sustainable, uh, is another matter given current trends in international agricultural commodity prices. That is uh, linked to uh, a, a second threat that receives little attention in the concept, and that is Georgia's vulnerability to change in the international economic environment. I'll mention two dimensions. One is the significance historically of international assistance to uh, building the Georgian state and economy. Aid budgets are currently under considerable pressure. A second is uh, market and price vulnerability in food commodities in the context of a high level import dependence. I could go on to talk about uh, internationally rooted vulnerabilities associated with uh, foreign direct investment uh, and in investor confidence, uh, remittances, and debt, but there's no time. My point here is that Georgia's enthusiastic embrace of the global economy, uh, which I think is the right, was the right way to go, uh, it carries risks that are extremely important and that ought to be considered in the analysis of security threats. A third set of issues that deserves a greater attention, uh, it seems to me, is Georgia's uh, immediate South Caucasian context. Uh, references to Azerbaijan and Armenia and the concept are pretty uh, cursory and general. However, the impact of a renewal of war between Armenia and Azerbaijan would have extremely damaging consequences for Georgia, or it could potentially have such consequences. The same is true of the possibilities of spillover from North Caucasian uh, conflicts. There is a section in the paper on the North Caucasus, but since uh, the region has been so ably discussed by my colleague, I will leave that alone. This leads me to the concept's treatment of Russia. Um, there is a very long discussion of, the, of Russia in the paper, and I'm sure some people might think it is a long and tendentious uh, discussion. Uh, I shall summarize. Um, Russia uh, in the concept is cast as a permanently hostile and aggressive uh, state uh, responsible for the Abkhaz and Ossetian conflicts, fostering anti-Georgian terrorism, unwilling to accept Georgia's existence as an independent state, committed to Georgian failure, and committed to returning Georgia, or what's left of Georgia after it fails to Russia's orbit. It seems to me that uh, this account ignores two reasonably obvious empirical points. One is that the degree of conflict in the relationship has varied over time. Sometimes it's been better than other times. And that would suggest that, that the quality of the bilateral relationship is not so much permanent. 
determined, but it is also policy dependent. It depends on policy choices here and also policy choices in uh, Russia. Second, um, the concept fails to acknowledge that with respect uh, the possibility that Georgian actions may have contributed to the poor relations between the two states. That might, if, if it is possible that Georgia's actions might have contributed to the poor relationship, then change in Georgia's approach could produce a, a degree of normalization in this rather significant bilateral uh, relationship. However, there is no analytical consideration of this possibility in the concept. Instead, Russia is portrayed as an incorrigible aggressor and Georgia the persistent uh, victim. And of course, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying, I, I, I think I understand that view. I mean, if your neighbor invades your country and slices about 20% of it off, I can understand that you might feel the grieved. Um, but as such, uh, if you think about that portrayal or that narrative on Russia, and you ask, okay, what about policy options? The, the obvious policy option for Georgia is an attempt to balance against Russia through an attempt to integrate with the West and its institutions. There's much to be said for this direction of integration, but uh, as a dominant national security option, it also contains significant risk. Not least, it depends on whether we're willing to dance with you. Um, it depends on the willingness of the proposed partners to accept the role, essentially, uh, in extremis, to accept a commitment to defend Georgia against Russia and to fully integrate Georgia into their structures. The paper discusses NATO, the EU, and the US in this context and uh, suggests, uh, right here wrongly, that there is significant reason to doubt whether the West is willing to accept these commitments to Georgia. There are at least two reasons for this. One is that Georgia is not strategically significant enough to take real risks in major relationships. And there is a discussion in the paper of strategic significance of the Caucasus as well. And the second is that a number of Western allies worry that going all the way with Georgia uh, would harm their relations with Russia, which to them is more strategically significant. By way of conclusion, uh, and trying to keep to my commitment to uh, be disciplined, uh, I'd like to return to where I started. Although for reasons stated, I have some doubts about the concept's uh, value of strategic analysis, I think it clearly serves political and communicative purposes. Playing down internal political risk and domestic international economic threats is consistent with a discourse of domestic calm and economic success, which is, I think, fundamental to the narrative of this government. It is also useful in attracting foreign direct investment, um, to the extent that you're credible in conveying the issue, it alters other people's calculations of investment risk. The embrace of democratization uh, facilitates diplomacy towards the West, if not integration into it. The treatment of Russia in the concept legitimizes the government's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia and delegitimizes those in the opposition who argue for the possibility of improvement in relations with Russia. <clears throat> Emphasizing the strategic significance of Georgia and the region is a discursive mechanism to attract deeper Western engagement. In short, I think the concept does rather better on political framing than it does on strategic analysis. This is worrying since the price of getting security policy wrong in places like Georgia is or can be, and it has been demonstrated to be, 
rather high. Thank you very much. Uh, now I will put my chairman's hat back on and uh, give the floor to Natalie to take this apart. Now, looking at the concept and then moving to the reality of national security, it is a public document um, and, of course, political messaging is an important part of it. In some respect, it's probably good that it does not go into a very detailed discussion of the neighborhood situation, etc., because saying something wrong could be worse than saying very little, again, given that it is a public document. So some of the things probably will have to be left or read in between the lines. Another point that is worth keeping in mind is that, of course, it is um, it reflects Georgian position. It's not a balanced academic paper. Um, it's not very subtle, I agree, um, but it is clearly um, one-sided. But here, again, it it matters um, who are the actors and. What, who stands behind this? Um, you know, the framing of national security policy, national security interests, is also dependent on who the actors are, and they project a specific uh, image and a specific position of the country. Now, I know I sound very constructivist, but you once told me in Oxford that we are all constructivists now, so I'm going to play that card again. Uh, there are some perennial national security uh, priorities, territorial integrity, sovereignty, independence, basically survival. But the ways of achieving it uh, vary, and I think it does depend on who defines these ways. Uh, it's important to look at how actors uh, construct national interests and how these interests transform. Um, and this is, um, this is not an easy task, and in some ways, it, in, in many instances, states find it difficult to define national security interests beyond the mere survival and physical well-being, which is pretty generic, until they understand who they are, what exactly are they representing. So what is the kind of identity that state is trying to uh, project? And this point of construction of self-identity is quite interesting because it is on the one hand construction of self-identity and also uh, construction of the perceived identity of another, of the other, and in this case uh, it will be Russia. And I think this will, I will come back to this uh, when discussing relations between uh, Georgia and Russia. Um, but let's move now to the reality. And you touched upon the policy options. Um, what are really policy options for Georgia? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a problem in the concept. Not so much the messaging, which I do not find too problematic. As I said, it is a, it is a public document. And, and the fact that it projects certain identity and a certain perception is uh, legitimate. Uh, the bigger problem is, of course, that, oh, that it overplays and downplays certain threats. And if it is based on poor analysis, it is, of course, a problem. Now, we heard good analysis. So what are Georgia's policy options, given the good analysis? Not many, I'm afraid. You mentioned balancing. For, two, for small countries, uh, there are mainly two options, balancing and bandwagoning, which you discuss in, uh, in, in the paper. Um, and you do not actually come to an explicit conclusion but allow me to make that one for you. You say balancing is a better option in theory, but you have to have sides to balance. Uh, and balancing with the West, when the West is not particularly willing, um, may not be a very prudent option. Now that leaves bandwagoning. But can you really bandwagon with a state you consider to be an enemy? Um, that is another question. Perhaps Georgia could have done an option of bandwagoning with Russia before 2008. And even that is, um, even that is questionable. And here again, this point of constructing self-identity, I think, comes into picture. Um, and I do think that problems in relations between Georgia and Russia are more than uh, troubles, uh, dislike, personalities. 
um, there is um, there is more to it. Um, and if you look at the evolution of this relationship, it's interesting that every time a new president came to Georgia, he tried to um, to have some kind of a rapprochement, find some kind of rapprochement with Russia. They all tried, and they all, in the end, ended up taking a different position. Uh, it was interesting with Sharon, not that George mentioned, and also Sakashvili, the first thing he did was go to Moscow, make some, you know, good, try to establish good relations with Putin, came back perfectly happy, and this is where we are now. Um, and I think partly, and I'm not sure about that this is also interesting, because this whole notion of Georgia's Western orientation comes to form, you know, the phrase that this is formed um, under Shabanata. Um, and the West as part of Georgia's national discourse, this is more than um, something created by Sakashvili. Uh, and I think this is where it is important, because that construction of Georgia as a Western, the Western identity goes back to the early days of independence, and even uh, dark, it goes back to the uh, national movement uh, under the Soviet Union. Uh, starting from then, which is to a degree, one may say, is paradoxical, but the nationalist movement, which was quite strong, the nationalists actually had as an, its internal, integral part of the Western um, notion. You know, the West has been part of the nationalist discourse, even in the 90s. Uh, and that has then developed and played out more into a, a sort of a state policy under Shabatnata with the Western orientation and then uh, under Sakashvili. Now, this does not necessarily mean that it was always anti-Russian. Um, under Gamsakhurdia, this was sort of anti-Soviet, um, which are not, not clear. I think the Russian uh, situation there was a bit neutral. And only recently, uh, in the official discourse, it seems to have been strongly anti-Russian um, overtones. Partly, I suppose, that is explained by the traditional ambivalence of Georgia towards Russia, which is what uh, George had mentioned. I mean, for two centuries, Georgia finds it very difficult to decide whether Russia is a friend or a foe. Um, so this is, uh, this is an ongoing process. And uh, at the same time, one has to look at the way Russia has been developing, because you know, Georgia perceives Russia in, in, in certain ways, and this sort of form, the, the differences come to be entrenched much more recently under, as, as Putin sort of moves to define Russia more as an Eurasian power, with sort of Eurasian understanding, slightly different sort of, as an alternative to the West. Uh, you know, it's running, it's managing the state in a way that is alternative to the established Western tradition and it projects, tries to project it assertively, increasingly assertively, as a power which is um, sort of an alternative to, uh, to the Western influence. And this is where a clash between Georgia's self identification and that of Russia's become particularly uh, pronounced. It is difficult to find in this narrative. Um, common points. Um, of course, one uh, obvious of course, is, um, now, yeah, I have also have to mention that the pro-Western uh, orientation of Georgia is uh, not easy one to sustain either, because the problem is that West does not necessarily perceive Russia quite in the same antagonistic terms as Georgia does. So in some ways, an alienating Russia more can uh, end up creating troubles for Georgia in its relations with the West, uh, which makes a very difficult policy option for Georgia, whether it's balancing or basically a known option of bandwagoning at this point. Um, now, when it comes to developing a policy towards, uh, towards Russia and North Caucasus, I think this is, um, this is an interesting one. And listening to George, I had the feeling that um, you know, there was a sort of a mixture of uh, policy towards Russia as such and, to and policy towards North Caucasus separately and as part of Russia. In some instances, you seem to speak of North Caucasus as an entity which is separate uh, from Russia and the need for, for Tbilisi to have a coherent, uh, well-grounded policy towards North Caucasus. Now, is it North Caucasus 
as a part of Russia and as part of the greater Polish diplomatic relations with Russia or separately. I think what Georgian government now is trying to do is to delink its policy towards Moscow with that of North Caucasus and take North Caucasus separately and trying to project this soft power and sort of create an alternative center for people who North Caucasus to, to look at. Probably for the first time there is a, there is a kind of policy towards North Caucasus. You may argue it is a bad one, which I think new would because it is an uh, additional irritant towards um, Russia, but you know, it, is, it is a policy that is based on certain uh, calculations. The neighborhood as such, is it uh, uh, ethnic cultural autonomy? Is it secession? I think secession is not in North Caucasus is pretty much dead. But the Islamic revival is very strong and it is a very strong security threat, of course, both for Moscow and potentially for Georgia. I don't think we know how to deal with it. Uh, Tbilisi may not have a policy on the North Caucasus, but does Moscow have one? And I think that's also an interesting question. They need to have it more urgently, probably. Um, and it is also difficult to try to build and now we'll move back to relations between Caucasus as part of Russia. It is difficult for Georgia to understand what Moscow's policy towards North Caucasus is and try to sort of develop its own in relation um, to that. Um, now, of course, going back to the original question, why there is no uh, collaboration, um, I think a logical expectation would be that there should be a collaboration. There are, there are clear convergence of interests, including a normative and uh, very pragmatic interests, you know, the territorial integrity, the uh, control of the state. Um, but the reality in which it had played out, again, the experience shows that um, uh, you know, it has not worked out quite the way uh, Georgians had hoped for. And, um, and it's not clear how Russia also perceives it. I mean, Russia's involvement, again, going back to this idea of jumping a little bit, but on uh, in the Russian-Georgian relations, and the fact that it is more than narrative and, uh, and um, more than personalities. Throughout the independence, Georgia fought at different um, occasions to try to secure Russian support, particularly in the, in the sphere of conflict uh, settlement. Um, but Russia did not, or chose not to deliver on this, because from the Russian perspective, it, was, it played a sort of balance of threats um, approach. I was actually in Oxford not long ago, and uh, one close to Kremlin analyst mentioned that, well, Nagorno-Karabakh is actually a very stable conflict thanks to Russia. That is contrary to your analysis. You think it's unstable. They thought it was very stable because Azerbaijan was investing a lot of money in, um, in military, increasing its power, and Russia was helping Armenians, so it was keeping the, uh, the balance of threat and stability. So in some ways, that approach also probably underpinned Russian uh, logic and Russian policy towards uh, conflict settlement in Georgia. It was one, one thing to deal with Georgia as, as a, an international partner with an internationally recognized border, but always keep support of uh, secessionist entities to keep the balance uh, of power and basically keep uh, the conflict settlement an extremely difficult uh, process of reality. So, um, change of narratives. I think, George, you had a, an optimistic conclusion that the change of narratives could help with, uh, with making relations more rational. I think rational is, a, is an also a, a difficult thing to define. Again, it depends. It can be value rational. I mean, in some ways, what we consider to be rational. Um, uh, and as I said, uh, you know, from, from the purely realist point of view, Georgia's policy towards North Caucasus is irrational, but from a different point of view, it may be uh, argued that it is, it is one way of um, uh, sort of uh, projecting a, a, and trying to do something that has not been done before. Uh, so to conclude, I don't think we have many good options, but I would like to hear a little bit more from you on the possibilities that Georgia could could have in finding this and trying to balance in that or maybe do something else. Thank you.
um, for those excellent comments. So, as you know, the chair uh, uh, of the panel allows uh, panelists to respond to the discussant prior to opening the floor for discussion, and uh, he will continue with this pattern. Um, uh, the uh, panelist who is responsible for this paper um, has four comments. Um, I uh, fully agree on the, the often problematic combination of internal sources of insecure, potential insecurity and external majority and minority relations is a good one. Hitherto, concerning, let's say, the Armenian minority, uh, the Armenians have been pretty constructive. Uh, they have not actively tried to mess with this. The same is true with uh, the Azerbaijani government in the country, it seems to me. But you never know. I mean, it is a long-term vulnerability unless, uh, uh, to use your favorite word, integration is first understood and then achieved. Um, it's, but there's another linkage, which is the linkage between the mini regional security threat and the larger regional security issues. For example, let's say there was a mess concerning um, Karabakh. Um, it is true that Russia balances Azerbaijan is forced acquisition by basically either giving or selling stuff to the Armenians. It is also true, however, that the Russians have very serious transit difficulties. Uh, it, the, the ground transit is, so far as I know, shut across Georgia, and air transit is highly problematic, although there, is an interest, there has been an interesting increase in the number of Armenian military aviation traveling back and forth to Russia, which suggests that the trade is going on in airplanes that are not banned from Georgian airspace. Anyway, um, WikiLeaks has its utility, I have to say. Um, so, but if, if it goes up, and, you know, if Russia has an urgent need to resupply, it's quite possible they'll do that across Georgia. We know there is Russian scenario planning on transport corridors through Georgia, forced, um, courtesy of Pavel. Well, an hour. Um, so that's one point. Uh, it's just a long agreement with the wisdom of your observation. Uh, secondly, I, I guess your, your comment about the, 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 the distinction between perennial national security priorities related to survival and the construction of national security strategy and policy is a very good one, although as your as supervisor, I would advise you uh, always to question whatever your supervisor says you should always do. <laughs> um, uh, I, uh, I mean, I, uh, I think that narrative, and you've seen it in this panel, narrative and framing <coughs> are really significant political behaviors. Um, however, as uh, w w whatever singer it was said, we do live in a material world. And you're framing within material constraints. Up. So you have flexibility within, lots of choice within. If you make a choice that's outside the boundaries of constraint, you're going into trouble. This is uh, related to your point about balancing and then wiping policy options, which is my final area of comment. Um, you know, Kenneth Waltz is the father of structural realism, and he argued that, you know, states uh, basically can either balance or they, or they, uh, or they can bandwagon, and uh, basically many people have construed this, uh, his, his conclusions about that with respect to the international system to constitute policy recommendations. So, uh, uh, and to constitute, sorry, constitute determined decisions. But as he says somewhere else, uh, um, I have never argued 
that structure determines foreign policy choices. Uh, foreign policy makers can make choices that ignore structural constraint. That's perfectly possible. Elite construction, for example, cultural reasons, getting up on the wrong side of bed one morning, whatever. Um, but you know, he then goes on to say that the pattern of international relations suggests that leaders or governments who, in formulating policy, ignore cultural constraints tend to do very badly in the game of international relations. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, in other words, we live in a material world, but we perceive it and react to it in terms of social construction. That would be my, my methodological and theoretical take on this uh, interesting question. On policy options, balancing bed widening, there's a very interesting article by Paul Schroeder in International Security in about, I don't know, 2004, where he, it is, <laughs> it's uh, provocatively titled, I think, um, A Historian's Take on the Realist View of International Relations. And he just goes, basically, the whole balancing bed widening uh, a prediction thing. He basically looks at this as a historian and finds there are three or four other options out there. One is hedging, and another one is hiding. And he argues that hiding behavior is actually quite common as an alternative to uh, to uh, either accommodation bandwagoning or uh, balancing uh, through alliances with hostile third parties. Today. Um, and if you look at the former Soviet space as a whole, there are examples of attempts to balance against Russia. There are examples of efforts to, or, or of decisions to bandwagon with Russia. There are examples of hiding. I would put Turkmenistan into that category, the neutrality policy, for example. And there are examples of um, what's, what's the uh, hedging, I think. Also, Bajan is a classic hedger to sort of playing both sides of the fence um, and doing so quite successfully. So uh, this is all rather general. What about specifics uh, in terms of what can Georgian policy, what could Georgian policy be? Uh, I, I am already, I, I am, have always been slightly uncomfortable uh, <coughs> about the criticism of the policy of a country in which I'm a guest. Um, I am even more uncomfortable with uh, sitting in front of a large group of citizens of Georgia and telling them what they should do. Um, but a few gentle uh, suggestions. Uh, oh, and, oh, sorry. Uh, a mini point in between. Uh, you're quite right about the, the, the inconsistency of narratives in this context is a major impediment to uh, improvement of the relations. I mean, it's very clear to me that Russia is committed to building and or rebuilding and then sustaining the sphere of influence in the Caucasus. Georgian policy is in the way of that. We know this. So, what then? We also know that the balancing option does not appear to have worked terribly well. Take uh, August 2008 as a minor example. Um, so, what do you do? Um, I think uh, anything you do would have to be slow and careful. I think I think that there's a lot of uh, how should one put it unconstructive discourse around Russia in the statements of uh, Georgian policymakers. It just infuriates them uh, the characterization that they get. Well, perhaps be a little bit less. Uh, Frank uh, might help. Uh, secondly, uh, um, in the context of, uh, I mean, basically, there, there, there are two ways of looking at the Russian view of this situation. What's really on their mind? What's really bugging them? Uh, one is that basically uh, they want to keep Georgia in there. Bit, and I think that there's a lot of that going around in Moscow. And the second is that they want to keep Western security institutions out of their orbit. 
Those are different things. Okay? And if and, and there are lots of people in Moscow who think that way, uh, including probably Lavrov. If that is the case, then it is possibly self-destructive for Georgia to advocate membership in NATO so strongly. Um, the problem with this whole kind of discussion is this sort of like, like counterfactuals, you know. We can't really know. Um, but the risks, it seems to me, of reducing the public pressure on the alliance to move forward are comparatively uh, acceptable. The risks of changing the tone with respect to Russia are probably acceptable, and there are ways of doing that that could be consistent with the overall narrative, it seems to me. Um, admittedly, that is a weak answer. Um, but what I do know is, at least what I think I know, is that the current policy uh, approach of Georgia towards Russia is, uh, has been, I think, um, uh, risky and dangerous. And that invites serious analytical consideration of alternatives. And I don't see that analytical consideration of alternatives. Thank you. George. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Madam, for your incisive comments. Um, um, on the on, on policy issue, which of course is hardest and also on decoupling um, the North Caucasus from Russia. I think what I try to say is exactly what was just to, to criticize the coherence of Georgian policy. When it comes to decoupling the North Caucasus from Russia, which you suggested might be the policy of the Georgian government now, then I would suggest there is yet another possible decoupling, and, the, the, and that is the North Caucasus from Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Right? There are different levels. And what the Georgian government may be doing is that once we don't speak to the Abkhaz and the Ossetians, and we don't speak to Russians, then by definition the only level that they are able to communicate is the North Caucasians. And yet, they, and, and, and even there, there is a serious problem going on. On the one hand, we recognize the genocide of the Circassians. On the other hand, we kill the Chechens. In, and eliminating uh, uh, people in Pakistan in, in, in the north, and that is that that, that that's my point. So uh, briefly to, I think, briefly to uh, sum this up, I think there are five options with respect to the North Caucasus. The first one is do nothing, essentially incoherent approach, which I think is happening. Uh, we are simply reacting what happens on a very ad hoc basis. Something, some development takes place and with respect, and, and then deriving from the political, um, how to say, um, um, the, not even political, by PR value of it, then we pick these issues and then sort of make them, uh, and then sort of make steps that are that don't derive from one, one vision. The second option would be a Machiavellian option with respect to the North Caucasus. Let's try to sort of play around, uh, divide and rule, you know, make enemies, alliances, and so on and so on. Um, I think the answer to that is that it's too diverse and it's too risky to do that. We have sort of tried that with English, with, with, with the English, with the Ossets, uh, with uh, uh, in in, uh, in uh, Dagestan, possibly somewhat. It, it never worked, and it's too dangerous to attempt. Third potential alternative would be siding with the North Caucasians with, against Russia, which I think is an implicit. 
very badly executed but implicit uh, drive of the current government. And sometimes was under Shevard as well, and clearly under Gamsakurdia. Well, unfortunately, the result of this is that you just cannot do that with the entire North Caucasus. It's too diverse, it's too complicated. And then we saw that as soon as you do that, you alienate Russians, you alienate some North Caucasians against the others, and ultimately, the final result of our policy of the last 20 years was that both Russia and North Caucasus are our enemies. Uh, and, I mean, what, what worse could happen? The fourth one is what actually happened, alienation of both Russia and the North Caucasus. Because we are a Western power, we side with NATO and the EU, and therefore Corrupt and, back, uh, corrupt and backward Russia, as well as terrorist and Islamic North Caucasus, they should be our enemies because we are uh, European, we are aspiring to become members of NATO, and that is sort of the, the, the most short sighted take on, on, on that policy. And finally, and this is what I try to suggest, not decisively, but somewhat as a policy option. Maybe out of all these five, and this is a fifth option, siding with Russia against the North Caucasus, if you will, to stabilize the region, and slowly to start groping for that option, which almost never happened before, except for in minor cases that we also random and um, sort of, uh, not very um, coherent. Maybe that can be an option. And, and that might happen, despite uh, how implausible that may sound. Uh, we have an example of WTO negotiations. The, the, the two cases may, may look they are sort of world apart from each other. But that is exactly what I argued. If you take the question of the North Caucasus out of the context of global politics, and you don't see it as a systemic problem, like WTO, right? And then you start an incremental approach with collaboration with Russians. Maybe that can be a, a very thin uh, possibility that might materialize, at least as Neil suggested, I mean, these slow, cautious approaches may be more fruitful in the longer term than um, any decisive actions. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um,